Hi everyone, Dr. Racker back with you for day four of NSCI 306. We are finishing up week two and heading into our first major paper. So today I want to continue our discussion of making arguments well with a specific question of using evidence. Uh, this is obviously particularly important in scientific endeavors because no one's gonna take your word for it. If you say, we did this experiment and this thing happened, or this is how atoms move, or this is how people behave. And that's probably a good thing. It means that you have to show your work and you have to tell your reader not just what evidence you're using, but why that evidence is appropriate for the work you're doing. So it's good to keep that in mind as we go. Let me switch over to our lecture notes. And we will not be marshalling all the evidence for or against the question in the meme here of whether God exists partly because I am neither a philosopher nor a theologian, but also because we just don't have the 100 or 150 or, okay, a lot of days that it would take to go through all the arguments. I do, however, want to give you some tools to make arguments well, using evidence effectively in your papers. As you remember, one of our principles this quarter is to use evidence clearly and honestly. So in part one, I'm going to engage that both in terms of ethics. We're gonna talk about how to define and avoid plagiarism, including the procedures for that process in Cal State system. I'm gonna show you how to document your sources specifically, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about using these three main kinds of evidence in your academic papers, summaries, paraphrases, and quotes. The last one I'm gonna spend the most time on because that's where you engage with the text more often. That's what we'll be doing a lot of this quarter. In the second hour, we'll be looking specifically at structuring scientific arguments using your readings from They Say, I Say, and from Science and Society. And I do wanna spin that out a little bit to show how that fits into the They Say, I Say model. I think that will be helpful as you start to structure your first response paper, or your first major paper, first response paper is done. Uh, to use that, to, to show how that works in real life, I'm gonna look at an article on laptop multitasking in the classroom which we'll actually be reading as a class later on this quarter, but I think it's a good example of how they engage previous scholarship to make their own point. And I will finish up second hour by looking at the week three assignments because they'll work a little bit differently than they have before. So hopefully your other professors have also told you about CSUSB's plagiarism policies. I do wanna go over them so you know the rules that you're under and the responsibilities that you and I both have in our respective roles. They define plagiarism pretty simply, the act of presenting the ideas and writings of another as one's own. I'm gonna get into a little bit later uh, some detail on what needs cited and how to do that. But in general, if someone else came up with an idea, if they structured an argument a certain way, if they use certain examples, certainly if they use the certain words, then you need to acknowledge that. And I have a link for you later on. We would go over it if we were doing a, a synchronous class, but I think I encourage you to do that just kind of to practice assessing whether citations are used correctly. So I'll, I'll highlight for you, for you in a few minutes. Um, plagiarism at Cal State and at every other school I've ever taught at is a question of academic dishonesty because it's not just a matter of someone else doing the work for you, but it's saying something about your work that fundamentally isn't true. Now, it's important to know that both of us have responsibilities in this process. As an instructor, I have to follow a certain set of procedures. Um, so far, I have not had to do this at Cal State, which I think is a good thing. But um, I did have a few cases back at Ohio State. My first responsibility is to find my own evidence, which is our topic for today anyway, supporting any allegation I have, whether it's one or two quotes um, that are plagiarized, or whether it's an entire paper, and I have unfortunately seen both of those cases uh, at previous schools. So my first job is to preserve that evidence. Usually that means finding the original source and tracking down exactly which parts I suspect are plagiarized. I then have to notify both you and the Office of Student Conduct and Ethical Development of the allegation and the relevant evidence. So they have a copy of that, and you do have the right to request that their office handles that um, and evaluates that evidence 
alone without having me involved directly. Um, if you just think that would be a more objective approach, that's your right. After you have seen the allegation evidence, you have a reasonable opportunity to challenge that. So you might explain, well, I, you know, I just forgot to put the quote marks here. And I, I do try to be aware of missing citations versus kind of malicious plagiarism. Or maybe just say, well, yeah, that technically appears there, but I totally came up with all that on my own. And in those cases, we usually have to go and work with the um, OSCED and figure out the best approach for that. Whether I, we do that um, with them or whether I settle on a penalty directly, I then have to notify you of what action is taken there. And over the years, I've done uh, different approaches to that. Usually, there is a grade penalty. I'll typically assign a zero for any plagiarized assignment. Um, in some cases, I may have the student redo the assignment if it's part of something larger, like if you write a proposal for a project and you plagiarize the proposal, well, then I can't really let you move forward with that topic because it's kind of hard to trust you at that point. Um, those are ethical elements here. So I might say write a new one there. As an instructor, I just want to be upfront about this. I'm really good at detecting plagiarism. I've been teaching for 15 years, and especially in English classes, we do a lot of writing. And one of the reasons we do um, so many smaller assignments, you know, the self-evaluations and the response papers and all that stuff, is so I can get a sense not just of your strengths and weaknesses in writing, but of your writing style. And that helps me predict how and when you are making progress and where I might need to look a little closer to make sure that everything is um, above board on your paper. So the first thing I look for as a red flag is some inconsistency in the style, diction, claims, or the complexity of your argument. Um, I have run into students who try to cobble together several different sources and not cite any of them because they don't think they can make a good argument on their own. But it's really obvious if you're used to reading that person's style, what's changed here, or even sometimes if there's contradiction within the, the same paper. I also pay attention to topic changes. This doesn't mean you can't ever change your topic in this class, but if something happens at the last minute, or if this is the first time I've heard a new topic, then I'm gonna look a little bit closer at that draft because very few, if anyone, decides to plagiarize when they are confident in their writing, when they have plenty of time for the assignment, when they know they can do the work. It's usually at that last minute you make a bad decision. You say, I really don't have time to do this or I'm not capable of doing this work or something is gonna prevent me from, from putting in this effort. And so I also look at writing or ideas far more advanced than the student's usual level. Now, this is an area where I am very happy to be proven wrong. I love seeing my students make good progress in their writing, especially between assignments. So maybe on response paper one, you struggle with how to integrate quotes effectively or how to engage with that analysis. And on paper two, you've just got it done so much more smoothly. That's a great feeling as a teacher. But I also know that writing progress, even my own writing progress, moves generally slowly and it moves incrementally. So you might get one or two things that you do much better on, a few, on one paper, but it'll take you a little while for the whole process of the whole skill set to catch up. So if you start turning in papers, um, if you, let me put it this way, if you've struggled to do some basic things like put together a paragraph or, um, master even basic English grammar, and suddenly you're writing like my grad school professors, uh, I'm probably gonna take a second look at that draft. Along with the point earlier about topic changes, if papers are late or if they're turning at the last minute, and particularly in cases where there's no rough draft or no topic proposal, um, which would be relevant in this course for paper two, then that can indicate that the student had not been working on that beforehand. Um, and let me just say here, a good way to avoid plagiarism and to inspire 
your instructor's confidence in your writing is to stay in touch about your work. This is one reason why I have scheduled the rough draft conferences this quarter so that after I give you written feedback on your rough draft, we'll actually be sitting down and talking via Zoom for five or 10 minutes just on where I think it should go in the final draft revisions. And this is why you're also always welcome to come by office hours or just to send me an email saying, hey, this is what I'm struggling with or this is what I wanna work on or can you tell me if this is okay? Because I'm a lot more likely to give those students the benefit of the doubt. Lastly, occasionally I'll get papers that are good but are obviously for a different assignment. Um, sometimes, and if this, this goes beyond, let me clarify, this goes beyond just, you know, you analyze only two quotes instead of the assignment says three. Um, it's like you don't analyze any quotes and you're talking about a random movie instead of the, the, the story or something we got you were assigned. Um, once in a while, these will show up. And usually this means that the paper was written for a different class, sometimes by the student, sometimes by someone else. And it was recycled. Now, in California, we generally like recycling, I know, but please do not recycle your papers um, in that sense. I want to, you to write ori on original topics and use new ideas because you're a new writer, you're a new thinker every time you come up to a new paper. All right, now that I've scared you, <laughs> Uh, let me give you some tips for avoiding plagiarism. It starts with topic selection. I want you to choose topics that are unique and specific. So I try to design my papers, my assignments, to avoid the super common kind of cliche paper topics. And part of that is because I got tired of reading the same three papers over and over. But I also find that the students who are most engaged with their writing, with those topics, are the ones who write the best. Uh, for example, when I teach freshman composition, uh, 105, 106, 107 here, in their research papers, I require them to write about some topic that makes a difference in their everyday lives. And so I get a lot of interesting topics. I learn a lot of interesting things about my students and it helps them keep engaged with the topic. Now you don't always have that level of choice in your papers, but you should find something that is clearly fitting with the assignment uh, for both, for paper one, I gave you a list of previous articles that students have written about, and for, for both papers one and two, I gave you sample papers. So if you're having trouble finding a topic or finding an article to write about, please get in touch with me. It's also a good idea to complete any topic proposals or pre-writing pre assignments so I know what you're doing and so I can kind of guide you in those ways. Not only does this give you points because there are points attached to you know, topic proposals or um, to your peer workshops and stuff like that, but it serves as a useful check-in point. Um, and I know this is especially a struggle in online classes. I took a, a, an online class in college and it was on uh, vocabulary from Greek and Latin roots. I don't really remember why I took the class. I guess I thought it would probably be easy. And we didn't have a lot of online classes back in the late Jurassic period, but this was one of them. And I was probably the least motivated of, in, in any of my classes because I didn't have the professors or the classmates kind of around me to exert that, that positive pressure. I didn't have regular check-in points. It was just kind of, yeah, do this homework thing and maybe do this reading. And by the way, there's an exam in three weeks. And so it was easy to put that to the back of my mind. And so having these check-in points that I built in um, twice a week is a good way to kind of keep yourself honest in a way that um, is often difficult if you're not physically in the classroom or actually having to go to campus and kind of put that time aside in your week every day. Your week every day, that made no sense whatsoever. Put <laughs> that time aside in your week every week, how's that? Another good technique is to avoid switching topics if possible. If it does come up that just your topic is not working at all, then I want you to get in touch with me. You can send me a text, you can send me an email, you can come my office hours and 
explain to me what you want to work on instead and where, why you were switching. Because I have had students come to me and say, I have to switch from a new topic. I really like this one, but I can't find any sources on it. And in that case, I can say, hang on, let me take 10 minutes and sit down with you on Google Scholar or whatever it is and find something that you could write about. And I'd rather do that and let you use the intellectual work and the pre-write and everything you've done already than have to switch to something completely new. Of course, the other big reason for that, uh, to, to avoid switching topics, is that it, it means resetting your work and having to do a whole lot of work on a completely new thing. Um, and that can be really difficult, especially in a time crunch. I had this situation come up in one of my graduate seminars um, back at Ohio State. And you know, we were writing typically a 20 page paper at the end of the quarter. And so it takes a lot of work. And the way this professor had set things up was that we would do a annotated bibliography. It's kind of a proposal. We look at the literature on the topic. And then we would use that to write our research project. And so I picked a topic. And I wrote my bibliography, and as I was going through the sources and reading whatever other people have done and figuring out where I could contribute, I realized something. I didn't actually care about the topic anymore. There was nothing that I could realistically contribute that I could see myself writing about for 20 pages. And I had already done all this work, and it was two or three weeks before the end of the quarter. You know, I was also teaching, so I had my own research papers to grade, and I got stuck. Um, and so I went to my professor, I took a deep breath, and I said, I need to switch my topic. I, I have no idea what I could write about for the topic that I had originally picked. And to her credit, she told me two very important things. One, she said, are you sure? <laughs> and so I explained, oh, yes, this is what I thought I was going to do, but doesn't actually get, it's not actually going to work this way. And here's another topic that I think is going to work much better with my interests and my skills. And she said, she said, okay, I'll let you do that. And the other important thing she did was help me, help point me towards useful sources for my new topic. Um, and I really appreciated that because at that point I had two weeks to put together a completely new proposal. She didn't make me do the intended bibliography again, but a new proposal and a 20 page paper. And it was a really exhausting two weeks. I didn't sleep much. I would not recommend trying to do that with a 20 page paper or with even with a, a shorter paper, but it convinced me that I need to be clearer about what I want to write about. And I want to make sure that I have the, the motivation and the willingness to do that. So if you want to switch your topic, do me a favor, let's sit down and talk about it for 10 minutes and we can figure out whether this is your best plan of action. And if it is, how I can maybe help you with the new topic as well. You also want to give yourself lots of time for the drafting and revision process. Um, one of the reasons that I, I spend these first few lectures going back over some of the background stuff from comp one is because it's easy to forget the writing process, especially if you've been in classes that aren't very writing intensive. And so assume that it's going to take at least twice as long to draft anything or to revise a paper as you expect, and that will let you approach, if not exactly at a calm pace, at least at a more reasonable pace. As I said before, most students, if they decide to plagiarize, they make that decision at the last minute rather than thinking a week and a half, week ahead of time. That deadline's coming up, but I don't want to write the paper. I'm just going to copy it from the internet. Lastly, err on the side of caution. Add a citation. If you think a citation might be needed, if you're not sure how to cite it or what to cite, ask me. I'm an editor and an English professor, so I have the basis pretty much covered. Talk to instructors, even talk to your classmates um, as you're doing the peer workshop next week. It might help to add a comment in your draft, rough draft saying, hey, I think I should cite this, but I'm not sure how. Maybe your classmate can help you do that. But I'd much rather have those conversations, explain the things earlier, than have to talk about, ooh, now we have the plagiarism case coming up um, later on. So what do you need to cite? The short answer is everything. Uh, the long answer is just about everything. Obviously, if it is not your material. So any direct quotations, whether it comes from a 
dusty old book from the library that was written 150 years ago, or from a website that you saw today. Whether it's one word or 100 words, you want to put the quote in quote marks. You want to indicate any changes you make in square brackets. I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. And you want to put a parenthetical citation at the end of the sentence. That'll look differently in APA or MLA, so I'll go over those details later as well. You also need to cite other people's paraphrases, even if all the words are different. It helps to add a signal phrase. So according to Smith, Smith claims that, Smith argues that. In The Unbearable Smithness of Smithing, Smith insists that. Use that to introduce the material you paraphrase. Again, add the citations. It helps to cite specific pages if you can do that. This is a tricky one. You need to cite information that may not be common knowledge. Uh, a good litmus test, if there's an argument involved, you need to cite it. If you are just citing a fact and every, well, not everyone knows it, but you know, if it's common knowledge, easily available in multiple sources, it's probably safe to leave it without a citation. But let me say this. What counts as common knowledge may differ dramatically depending on your audience. So if you are citing something about the nature of the physical universe in a physics class, you probably don't need to get a specific citation. For instance, if you say, here's why I scramble madly to remember something about physics, um, that water boils at 100 Celsius. Celsius, yeah. Okay, okay, 100 Celsius. There we go. But it might be less known in an audience of non-specialists. And so this is where I think Aaron on the side of caution is helpful, um, especially in a rough draft. I'd rather tell you, you don't need a citation here than tell you, yeah, all the stuff needs cited because that's a lot more work for you. Also remember to cite your visuals. If there is a graph in an original source, any sort of picture, um, even if you created your own graph from someone else's data, you need to cite where you got that data. There are specific ML and API guidelines for citing images and figures, and you can refer to the links on Blackboard or the survival kits in the library to do that. A couple of good resources here. First, the citation flow chart will help you figure out what you actually need to cite and goes through a lot of the, the same material I drew on um, that's, that uh, document quite a bit for this slide. This is the page I was mentioning earlier. Um, this is an interactive exercise to assess citations. What this will do is take you through 15 or 20 questions, and you basically read the original passage. You read the, the material that appeared in the, the, the hypothetical student's paper, and you say, is this cited appropriately? Um, I recommend that to everybody. If we were meeting in person, I would be doing this in class um, because it's, it's a really useful resource. So take a look at those two when you have a few minutes. In terms of documenting sources, there is some software that can help you, um, especially when you're doing research projects, as you will later on this quarter. Zotero is very helpful to keep track of material. You can also do one-click citations there. EndNote Web. Um, will help you track down bibliographies and organize those as you go. Um, I'm a big fan of keeping a bibliography going as you write the paper so that you don't leave out any sources at the end. Other sites, um, Mendeley is useful. Cite this form you may have come across. There's stuff like Citation Machine. I looked into a couple of charts to um, help you decide which ones work there. You could also use sites like Google Scholar or the Cal State Library to generate citations. Now, they're done by computer, and so it's garbage in, garbage out. Sometimes there's a glitch in the tool, and so you want to double check that against your style guide instructions. I like Google Scholar. Um, the, the Cite Me button looks like a, a quote mark, so under each, each entry you'll see a little quote mark but I know that they have slight inaccuracies, at least APA Chicago styles. So make sure you, you double check those before you turn in your paper. I also recommend what one of my professors called writing a paraphrasable argument. Uh, this is just 
writing summaries in your own words of the main findings, the main claims as you go. It's particularly helpful to distinguish between similar sources because a lot of scientists will write around the same set of research questions, but in slightly different settings. And it's easy to confuse them, especially when you're trying to remember a whole bunch at once. This was invaluable for me when I took my PhD exams because I had to read a set of 125 books. And some of them were novels or poetry collections and some literature, of course, but a lot of them were scholarly books. And I could not keep the argument straight if I just relied on my memory. And so I'd write down paragraph, two paragraphs, maybe a page or so of what is this person's main claim and how do I connect this? How, what can I say that's intelligent about this? How can I answer questions about it? It was really helpful. One thing I will encourage you to look at, especially for our research paper, is a literature review. Sometimes there are entire review articles or what's called a meta-analysis. And that just is analysis of previous work that's been done on a, the same question. So you might have a meta-analysis, you do this alone in medicine, of uh, effects of a particular treatment for type 2 diabetes in children. Rather than conducting a new study, the author of the meta-analysis will review, say, 40 or 50 studies and say, what's the same about here? What do they find different? What could be improved in future studies? What's kind of the takeaway? Also, there are review articles, sometimes of new books on the topic, or even just of a single book that can give you a good sense of what's been going on in a field. I strongly encourage you to talk to professors about those and get a sense of how that works in your major. Here's some instructions on the NTAC citations. Again, refer to the documentation on Blackboard for more details here. Um, basically, anytime you cite a source, you need an in text citation. If you paraphrase it, summarize it, or quote it directly, and you need a work cited page in APA that's called references. At the end of the paper, that lists all the sources that you used. So for in-text citations, MLA looks like this. You have the author's last name and the page number. So this is Adams, page 42. You may be citing stuff from the web or stuff that doesn't have a page number. Um, the easiest way to do this in MLA is just the author's name, comma, and then some version of the title. So the full title here is So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. You might do it this way. You could say thanks or all the fish. Probably for all though would not be very helpful to distinguish between the sources here. In APA, regardless of, oh, I looked up part of my point there. Regardless of the um, venue, so online sources or print sources, your in-text citations will include the author's last name and the year of publication, um, with a comma in between. For the direct quote, I meant to write the rest of this uh, bullet point. If you cite a direct quote, you also include that in your citation. So it would be Adams, comma, 1984, space, P for page, a dot, and then the page number, and then you end the citation there. For your reference lists, you're going to need more bibliographical information. Um, and I'm not going to go over all the details of every single citation style because they're kind of tedious here. But the idea is that your readers could potentially find your sources to check up on them. Um, I do this often, especially at the rough draft stage, to make sure that the sources are appropriate or that you're actually saying what you're saying that they do. You're going to alphabetize these by the author's last name and put that on a new page at the end of the document. And so you want to go to the MLA APA guides um, to make sure that those are correct. You can use these sources, uh, the software sources that I mentioned earlier, to help you with that as well. Okay, so that's more of the, the mechanical side of things. Um, I want to broaden out a little bit in the, the rest of this video and look at how to use evidence kind of more generally. What sort of evidence is appropriate and how do you connect that to your actual paper? Because while citing the quotes and bringing those in and integrating them is important, Analyzing them is the main thing. These papers are about you, not about all the sources that you can find. I would encourage you to mix summary, paraphrase, and direct quotes 
in all of your papers. Summaries and paraphrases are both in your own words, but paraphrases reword a specific quote from that text. So let me show you how this works. Our original quote, Jefferson, of course, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. All right, pretty simple, straightforward uh, method for citing that. All you need to do is throw in the parenthetical citation right here and then end the sentence after that. If you're paraphrasing it, the first thing you do is to keep it in the author's voice. So think of it, um, if you're recounting a conversation that you had earlier in the day, you probably are not gonna remember the exact quotes and do a back and forth. But you might say something like, so that I said, blah, 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 and then he was like, blah, 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 blah. I was like, no, no, blah, 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 blah. And you're going to sort of pretend to be talking in the other person's voice, but of course, it's in your words, for better or for worse. I want you to notice that there are certain rhetorical changes in any paraphrase. Doesn't necessarily mean they're inaccurate, but you need to recognize that you're not quite getting the original. It's sort of like a translation. So in this case, we go from, we hold these truths to be self-evident to we think it's obvious. And you could ask questions like, well, does that mean exactly the same thing? Do you have this idea of sort of an, an active process? We hold these truths and we have this claim that they are self-evident. They explain themselves, which maybe is a little bit different than obvious. Like everyone can see that. Perhaps more significantly in the second part, the paraphrase says that people are inherently equal. Well, the original says that all men are created equal. Now, you could argue, given linguistic and historical evidence, that Jefferson did intend, to, when he says all men means all people. But you could also point out historically that at the time he wrote those words, in practice, the people who enjoyed full equality were generally white male property owners. Everyone else kind of had to wait for mm, civil war or various constitutional amendments. And so the change from all men to people maybe is a little bit fraught there. Likewise, Jefferson uses this phrase created equal, and he's drawing specifically on religious language. Jefferson himself, well, his religious views were complicated. Look up the Jefferson Bible sometime. But he brings in this Christian language of creation, this idea that um, this is a, a specific result of the creative act. Whereas the paraphrase uses inherently equal. Uh, that to me suggests something a, a little bit different, that it's not the result of a creative act, it's the result of human nature. Um, it is, and I don't believe I'm gonna say this in a lecture, to quote Lady Gaga, you're born this way. Inherently might be more on that end than on the religious end um, that Jefferson was implying. So again, there's, there's a potential change here. For the summary, you change from first person in this case to third person because you're describing what the other person actually said. So we start off, Jefferson believes that human equality is part of human nature and thinks that this, this view should be clear to everyone. Again, arguably the content is the same here, but as I pointed out a couple of minutes ago, talking about human equality may be different from talking about all men are created equal. And talking about created may be different from saying it's part of human nature. So the paraphrase and the summary kind of start from the same viewpoint. And they both have the same rhetorical biases in here. And also the summary flips the order of the clauses. So in the original, the we hold these truths made self-evident, that part goes to the end here. Thinks that this view should be clear to everyone. And then only then we do catch up on the second one. Let me then move on to look at quotes specifically, because as I mentioned, you'll be doing a lot of this in your papers this quarter. So I have four rules for you. I'm gonna go over each one. And I think it's a good checklist to decide whether you're doing this well accurately and also in a way that improves your paper. It's not just say, here's a checkbox and you have two quotes in here, boom, quote one, quote two. So let me go through each of these with you.
First of all, in terms of quoting fairly and accurately, you need to be aware that in many different texts, different views are sort of ventriloquized, represented by the author without necessarily quoting someone directly. My favorite example of this is in, the, in Mark Twain's novel, um, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. The novel itself is in the first person. Huck tells the story, and he starts off by saying, you don't know about me unless you've read a book by Mr. Mark Twain called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Well, he mostly told the truth, but there are some stretchers in that book. So right away, we've got a character created by an author talking about the author's previous novel and saying that really wasn't the right, the whole story. Twain is messing with her heads here. But he also calls attention to the fact that the narrator acts as a, a character here, that there may be parts of the text that are in one voice that kind of talk to other parts here. Now that's in fiction, of course, but actually the same thing happens in a lot of scholarly work. Many articles, and I'll show you this later on in the second video, start off by saying, here's what other people have done. Here's what they have concluded. Here's what they assume. Here are the, the theories that are in effect now. And then there's a very important move, but here's what I'm going to say. Here's the they say, here's the I say. I'll show you how that works a little bit later today. You also want to read for context because quotes are not always there to support an argument. I told the story in my uh, day one lecture of the student who quoted the one bit in the Focus on the Family article that the author of that article completely disagreed with and attributed it to the same person. Led to a bit of confusion. In the same way, before you quote something, you need to understand very clearly what it says, and how it's working in that text. And if you're not sure, then read around it. See what is the context of that? Um, what part does this appear in? Do they attribute it to anyone? Is there a footnote or a citation at the end? Because that can give you a clue as to what's going on. And please double check your quotes for any typos or other inaccuracies. Um, if you do run into a spelling error or grammar error, Sometimes this is because texts are older and grammar doesn't work the same way it did then. Sometimes it's because a character sort of deliberately misspells a word or something. And sometimes uh, scholars will put in this phrase sick, uh, which is Latin for this is how it is literally. And they will uh, use that to say, well, this author used this totally politically incorrect word like he but I'm not gonna use this. So I'm just gonna point out how, how ill-informed and benighted the author was. I find it safest just to indicate outright errors there as in the widow seeks to civilize, which is Huck's spelling of that word um, and to use that to, uh, to show that difference. The second rule I recommend is to vary the verbs that you use in your to introduce your quotes. So as in fiction, in academic nonfiction, don't just say said every single time. A good way to get around this is to match the verb you use to the rhetorical role of the quote. So again, drawing from Huck Finn, uh, this might actually be Tom Sawyer. This is Tom Sawyer. Though Tom claims that some victims must be ransomed, he admits that he doesn't know what the word means. So you could say, though Tom says that some victims will be ransomed, he says that he doesn't know what the word means, but that doesn't really show your reader how those ideas actually work in conjunction with each other. You can also use different verbs to mark different parts of an argument. So let me show you how this can work in a progression. You might start with here at the top, Abram said reports. Reports is a good word to use if you are just giving data, giving information. And you'll see this a lot um, in all sorts of science writing. Here's the, the numbers. So this is where he's giving a quote, but then you have an argument, an interpretation of that. So you move to a different verb. Many users, Abramson suggests, seek out pinpointed conversation in online communities. Now, 
This indicates that the respondents themselves did not say, you know what, what I'm really looking for is pinpointed conversation. This is Abramson's idea and this is his interpretation. It's where he's making his argument. And so you need to indicate that's separate from what he's actually reporting. And then very simply, based on this, he concludes. You'd think this probably goes at the end, you'd be right. That, and then there's the long quote. So this is a good way not just to vary the reading experience for your reader, but to show how this is interesting or important um, by changing up how it looks just on the, on the page. The third key part of this is to move your argument forward. And this should be the goal of every single word of your paper. So what I wanna see when you give a quote is not just that you've read the text, I will assume that you've read the text if you're writing about it, but rather that you are engaging in some way if it, with it. Tell me something interesting about what you just read. You should match up your, your claims with your quotes, and it helps just to make a table in a separate document. Column one is the claim, and column two is the evidence. And if there's a gap anywhere, then you need to fill those in in your draft. So we go back to our Jefferson quote. You can make a claim rather than defending or analyzing them. Jefferson has said, has said assume certain truths to be self-evident. So the argument part is Jefferson is doing this, and the evidence is the words that he uses here. Very simple. You want to be clear and explicit about those connections, and you want to generate a lot of different potential ideas about the quotes. This is why I recommend picking out more quotes than you will need, because it's much easier to pull out the best ideas when you have a lot to choose from. Lastly, you want to blend the quotes with your prose, because this is, as I said, your paper. Don't let the quotes drown out what you have to say, because that's important. They may be smarter than you. There may be people with multiple PhDs that you're quoting. They may have smooth prose. They may have clear and clever analogies. They may have all the stuff that you wish you could come up with on your own, but you're still using them as tools. Use them to advance your own argument. If you do actually um, want to indicate changes, uh, I showed you one way to do that with SICK a little bit earlier. Another way you can indicate changes is if something in the grammar changes. So in this original quote, the actual quote, I believe, is, I wondered how the Bible would relate to the religion I practice. Notice there are several grammatical differences there. So we change this to will, and then he, because this whoops, sentence is in third person, and again, practices. Same thing works here. The original quote said, blocking will be something I quit on occasion. You change to she quits because you change that, you have the signal phrase there indicating the third person. When you're choosing quotes, get in the habit of working with small details from the text, rather than trying to quote the entire sentence even, or more than one sentence. It's very rare, especially in a short paper, that you need to quote more than one sentence to make a point. Find the stuff that is the most interesting, and stuff where you can say something specific about how that quote is organized or the words the author uses or the images or whatever it is that you want to go to and go back to the earlier lecture on close reading for some ideas on that. You want to make sure that every single quote adds something to your argument and that it relates to the main idea of your paragraph. Um, so it should point back to what you're doing in that paragraph, but also to kind of build on the work that you've done before. Keep that in mind as you choose which quotes to analyze. If you want to quote a lot of material, you need to do a couple of things. Put it in a block quote if it's going to like take more than three lines to write out on the page. Honestly, I don't think you need to do this more than once every five pages or so of your paper. And if you do that, I want to see a lot of follow-up analysis. I see too many drafts that just have a block quote uses up a lot of words and uses up a lot of space. And then the author says something like, so we can see from this that this journalist thinks that science is important. 
And that's when I start screaming at the laptop screen. What else? What, why can you say something else about this? Say something more intelligent. Of course, I don't write that in the comments. That would be rude, but that's what I'm thinking. To integrate quotes, it helps to use signal phrases I mentioned earlier. This helps you to transition from your words to the source's words. And of course, it just clarifies who is saying what, the they say versus the I say. And I like this technique, use a quote sandwich. Introduce and contextualize the quote in terms of your argument. Give it, of course, cite it as part of that, and then respond to it based on what you're doing at that point in the paper. So don't start a paragraph with a quote. Instead, say, even if it's something as simple as, you know, later in the article, the journalist claims blah, 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 end the quote, cite it, and then say, this is interesting because. If that helps you to start off as a template, use that and go from there. I'm not going to go through and count words, but I do want to see 85 to 90% of your words being your own ideas, your own analysis, rather than direct quotes there. So if you find yourself, it, it can help just to go through a draft and highlight all the direct quotes. And if your whole screen is yellow, then you need to go back through and do some more, put some more stuff in your own words and do some more work on individual quotes there rather than just letting them do the talking for you. Lastly, after you give a quote, don't just repeat the content because I want to see your argument. And if I see this, it suggests you don't actually know what to do with that source. Um, and that's not going to help your grade when I go through to evaluate that section. So let me show you a quick example of how this could work. Um, this is from a literature paper on um, a piece William Bradford wrote in, I believe, the 17th century. So the author writes, the Native Americans living in the area aided the struggles and efforts of the settlers, kind of a summary of the, the plot in this case. Squanto was used as an interpreter and traveled with the separatists. If they believe that Squanto, and here's our direct quote, was a special instrument set of God for their good beyond expectation. So we have the citation. And then the author zeroes in on a particular quote here, this idea of a special instrument sent of God, and interprets it. Says this is ironic because Squanto was there first, and Squanto wasn't a Christian, but the pilgrims put it in those terms, understood him in terms of God's providence. The author also then connects it to Bradford's own identity, kind of his overall goal in the, in the article, the Narrative, I guess, is the best term for it, saying that he is actually using the same model to understand his own leadership. So it's doing a couple of useful things here. It's showing, one, how this particular quote works, but it's also connecting it back to the larger goals, in this case, of the paper, saying how do we understand William Bradford as a leader, as an author, in terms of his narrative here. Some resources to Integrate quotes, um, these are focused on MLA format, but really the same principles apply. So for, use those for your files. We're gonna take a break here and then go back in the second hour and look at how this works specifically in science writing. So I'll see you back for that meeting.